Hi you guys. We thought that we would talk to you today about choosing the right RV. It's a question that's on everybody's mind when they're going out and looking for something. There's a lot of decisions to be made. Um, one of the things that we've learned is the right RV is the one that's right for you, you know, at that time. And you know, don't, don't aspire to something that's going to be five years down the road. If you want to get out there right now, get out there. Yeah, get what you can yeah. right now and get out on the road yeah. and have a blast. That's and the most important thing. It's all about the memories. It's not about the, the vehicle and the trailer and the right this and the right that. Get out there and make some memories with your family. Yeah, sometimes uh, what happens to me, and it might happen to a lot of us, is I get all hung up on the look and the appeal and what will the fellow campers say and they'll point at us and wave at us <laughs> if we get the right rig and all that all that testosterone nonsense, right? And the thing is, is it doesn't matter. You could use an old school bus, whatever gets you yeah. to where you're going and gives you a place to shelter that's all you really need to get out there. And I think the other thing too that I'll say, because I think it is the truth, there is no perfect rig. No. Get what you can that fits the needs that are most important to you. And those needs might change over time. Absolutely. Say you have children now and in the future, they, they you become an empty nester. The needs are gonna constantly it, it evolve. Yeah. yeah, absolutely yeah. it does. And, and it, it's really, really popular right now. Everybody's RVing. Um, so there's a limited amount of uh, campers out there. Honestly, um, we've been looking, we've been doing some research for you guys, and it's, uh, it, it's kind of sparse. But so, so just get what, you, get what you can afford, get what you can, get what you, you know, what'll make it fun. Just get out there and be So you, you've got a list right here. I did, I made a list. <laughs> so let's, let's go down your list. These are just some of the considerations that we have when we're out looking. And you know, we, we like everybody, one minute we, we think we wanna change out our rig, and the next minute we are happy to keep it. You know I'm in love with my, with my truck, but we've been looking or eyeballing class A's lately just for, just at the moment just for the fun of it. And um, so Donna, who is very much more organized than I am, uh, made a list of pros and cons and we thought, hey, let's share them with you because you may be going through this same process or you may be thinking about starting this process. So let's, let's talk about our list. So these are the different types of campers and just some pros and cons. So the first one that I'm starting with is a fifth wheel because that's what we have. And um, so under pros, I've got, first of all, they're the largest uh, outside of like a class A. They're really big and they sleep a lot of people. And then um, they have, uh, so they have larger holding tanks, your gray water, your black water, uh, your fresh water tanks. They're a little larger than you can get like in a trailer. This, and again, these are generalizations, right? It's not in every scenario, but I'm, I'm making generalizations from a comparison standpoint. And right? keep in mind that the whole list is that way. The whole list is broad. Yeah. So when we talk about a certain category or type of RV, we're talking very broadly because it comes down at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to what works for you and your family. So we have some broad considerations that we're thinking about here. It might be things you haven't thought of yet. Maybe you already have but they're just kind of my, my big picture issues with each one of these things. So then the last pro about the fifth wheel, you're either gonna pull something or you're gonna pull something, right? You're either gonna have a tow vehicle for your trailer or your fifth wheel, or you're gonna have a class A or a C and you're gonna need to pull something with that. So our view of that and our argument about that was if we have a fifth wheel and we're towing it with something, that tow vehicle will become our get around town vehicle. It'll become our transportation while we're at the campsite. Which is what we do now. Right now, as you know, we have a fifth wheel. We pull into camp, we unhitch, and then we have my truck to go look around town or do whatever we want to do. So it's a, it's, you can do this with just a class A or just a class C and not no other vehicle and once you're parked, you're parked. And then you have two options. You either break camp every time you want to go do something and you take your vehicle with you 
your house, right? Or your second option is you Uber and use public transportation or Bicycle. bicycles or electric bikes or what have you. There are options out there. We even talked about that recently. We were talking about class A's and, and one of the things we said is that up until we get the vehicle we'll tow with it, maybe we just plan to Uber when we're when we are places because we tend to we don't really go as you know we don't go out in the woods and on trails so we don't need an off-road vehicle to get us out somewhere so actually uber although it's expensive it can get expensive uber would actually work for us in, in our typical scenario but think about how your lifestyle will fit into those scenarios right what's important to you what, what are your your you know, create a, create a to-do list or a, a pros and a cons list for yourself and your lifestyle. So as far as the fifth wheel goes, the cons, okay, are they're more work than a motorhome, say. You pull in in a motorhome and there's nothing to unhook or anything. You just do your sewer and your water lines, power, you're done. Um, nothing to unhitch, but you might have slide outs, right? Yeah. But here's the, from what we've seen on most of the class A's, the newer ones, right? You literally do all of the leveling and, and stuff from the cab. From, it's right by your driver's seat on most of them. And you push your buttons and your auto level and everything. And the slide outs are like right there anyway. But to your point, there's no hitching and unhitching, which yeah. is a little bit, can be time consuming. And it's a little nerve wracking if you're not good at it. There's the backing up. Backing up is a little bit more of a challenge than, well, for, as a trailer as well. And then we find that the fifth wheels, because of the price point, okay, you're going to, it's a great value, right? Because you're going to get a lot for your money. But that being said, we find most fifth wheels are made more poorly constructed. Again, broad generalization, you can get a Lux or a Mobile Suites, those are very high end. You're going to pay more for them, but as a general rule, a fifth wheel is going to be less expensive, but you saw it, our, our veneers peeling off. So we knew it when we did it that we were buying a entry level fifth wheel. So uh, for us to have peeling veneer and, and those little uh, not so good of workmanship, we kind of expected that, to be honest with you. Our considerations were the floor plan and what we could afford at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other uh, con to the fifth wheel situation is they're heavy. Uh, they're heavier than a trailer as a general rule, and therefore your pull vehicle is going to have to be beefy. We started out with a Ford 150. F-150, yeah. With a trailer, and then we upgraded before we bought the next rig, and that wasn't quite beefy enough to pull um, what we had, so we had to get the 250. The, the 2500, we got the, the Dodge Cummins diesel. Yeah. You, you saw it, I'm sure. And then- and We then were doing we, okay with that one, right? And then trying to anticipate, like we all do, right? Is, What's our next rig? Well, our next rig might be a toy hauler. It might be something even heavier than what we have. So we we literally got what I consider to be a very good deal on, on the current truck we have, which is the F550 with the towing body. And it could, trust me, I know you know this, it could tow anything. It's four wheel drive, it's a dually. Um, and, and we knew that if we got into that, we could get whatever fifth wheel we wanted next and we would be fine. Trust us, the salesman on the lot is going to tell you you can pull whatever it is that you're looking at. Don't trust them. Do your do your math. Do your numbers. I don't think anybody who really knows what they're talking about is going to tell you you can pull a fifth wheel with anything less than a dually. When you get up to the 16,000 pound range, don't don't try to put anything on there that isn't a dually. Well, I don't know that you need a dually. I don't know that for because a lot of them are, are are lighter. They're, they certainly add to stability and safety. There's no doubt about it. Do you absolutely have to have a dually to tow a fifth wheel? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, but I will light. tell you this: that the F right, they make light fifth wheels, and the F one fifty is that's where your problem zone is is because a lot of dealerships will try to tell you that you can tow something with your f-150 yeah. that you really can't tow with your f-150 and i that crosses over to the 1500s and the other two uh, brands so just be aware that that 
you can certainly tow a travel trailer with a 150, but when you start getting in fifth wheel territory, you want to have something a little, a little bit beefier. You don't need a dually, but depending on what you're doing. There's a lot so, of calculators online that'll help you guys with those numbers. The other two considerations <laughs> on the con side of a fifth wheel is they're very long. You, it's, their length is good is the length, and you're going to have to focus on where you're going to stop for gas. So you're going to be looking at truck stops. You're going to be monitoring the scene before you ever pull into a gas station because backing up is a hassle. So, you know, more, more consideration that way. Also, a lot of them are too long for national parks. National parks have limits as to how mm -hmm. far KOAs have, have limits. So you want to take into consideration the length of your rig and those things you'll probably have more RV parking, which is more expensive. And uh, if you have a diesel pull vehicle, you've got def fuel, and there's just a lot of other considerations that way. So moving on from there, we go to into travel trailers. So moving on to trailers, travel trailers. Um, they are probably the least expensive of all your options. Um, they sleep a lot of people. They pull with a light SUV in some cases. You can even get teardrops and stuff that you can pull with a, a car. A minivan, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of options there. And they're a really good entry level camper, a uh, good beginner uh, type uh, situation. But with a travel trailer, you can still have some length concerns or considerations. Yeah. You still have to back them in. And Those again. Those are cons. We're on pros. Oh wow, I didn't know we had rules. Yes, there's rules. Okay, all right, go on, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay though. We'll I'm... save my part for later. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then you can stay anywhere. So those are the so those are the good things about a travel trailer, right? When um, you say stay anywhere, you mean stay parked, well, right? You can, well, you can stay parked, you can boondock easier because you can get solar panels. They, uh, a lot of them have uh, a suspension. Uh, you can pull them with like a Jeep or whatever, right? Right. And then, so yeah, you can go anywhere. They're not as, they're not as heavy, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, because they're not as heavy, you can get into places that you might not be able to get something heavier into. Um, they, they tend to, handle a little bit differently when you're towing them. Are we going into cons yet? Yeah, that's a okay, con. <laughs> we're, we're in cons now. So they tend to handle a little bit differently yeah. and um, uh, really for, for a tow vehicle, a fifth wheel is gonna probably be your most stable vehicle. However, there are things you can do for, to, with your trailer, which still falls into the cons category because it's more expensive and more hassle, but you can put uh, tow bars on them, stabilizing bars on them, and, and they, they'll tow just fine. We had a um, 8,000 pound Springdale that we towed be behind our F-150. We had to put, we had to put uh, a, a stabilizing hitch on there to make it work. And the hassle is you've got to hitch those up and unhitch those kind of as a separate um, we should totally do a, a completely other video just on that subject. Yeah, but it's a separate our... procedure, right? It's you, you hitch them and you unhitch them, but at the at the tongue. But you also got to unhitch the the stabilization bars as well. It's just Chains, more steps. It's light. more things to do. Yeah, there's a lot to do. And then another con to a trailer is um, there's not as many amenities, right? Typically. So you're going to end up with a single sink. You're going to end up with a small refrigerator. You're going to have maybe uh, not a porcelain toilet, but a plastic one. Um, you know, those types of things. You, you don't have as much storage typically. And then um, the other thing is in that vein, there's it, not as much longevity to a trailer, right? You're not gonna, you're probably not gonna live in a trailer for a long period of time. You're not gonna retire in one, right? Because they're just not gonna hold up as well as a few other options. And again, you can, people do and people <laughs> have done it, yeah. but typically yeah. you will not full time in a trailer. Um, uh, well, right now, uh, Mark and Trish on Keep Your Daydream, they're full-timing in an Airstream trailer. They full-timed with five people in a trailer when they started. And as you as you probably know about Airstreams, they don't have slide outs. Yeah. So there's not a lot of space inside. They're beautiful, but there's not a lot of space inside. And they're full-timing right now with a teenage son and 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 doing fine. The, I think they are the exception though. I don't think they're the rule. It's a challenge, and it's a challenge that they choose to take on. Again, you just got to figure out what works for you guys, right? 
So now we're going to move into class C's. Now those are typically uh, over a truck chassis, which means the front of them look like a truck. Maybe we'll put a picture. Or a van front end. You've yeah, seen them. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're a little bit boxy and they've got, usually have a van nose. An overhang um, above the cab. Yeah. There's a bed up there. So that's a class C. So uh, on the pros side, uh, as far as motor homes go, they are the more affordable as yep. a general rule. And we had one of those and we loved it, but go on. Uh, they will uh, be short enough you can get into national parks. They are a great entry level situation to motor homes, right? Uh, because the gas engines are easier and cheaper to work on. Mm -hmm. Did you want to hit on that? Yeah, you can you can change your own oil and your own air filter and you can check your fluid levels much easier than than with a diesel. Usually the the, the issue with diesels and, and um, I've got a diesel truck right now and we're going to talk about diesel pushers in a little bit, but diesels are just big bulky monster engines and so to get in and around like right now if I wanted to check the fluids in my pickup truck. I would have to get a step stool out to get up in there to get to the dipsticks and so on and so forth. So gas engines are always, in my opinion, always going to be e easier and less expensive to maintain. And if you do have a problem, they're going to be less expensive to get something repaired. And a lot of a lot of the little things I can do myself anyway. So um, so I, I actually. I love diesels and I love the sound of them and the smell of them and the power of them. But I will tell you for motorhome world, I, I will probably always lean toward um, a gas engine. Yeah. But okay. So, and then that moves us into the cons, right? The con of a class C is it's not a class A. <laughs> and what I mean by yeah. that is class A's are the superior chassis motorhome situation whether they're gas front engine or diesel rear engine they are in our opinion they are the the way to go right and, and but this is why we're going over it is because there's a lot of reasons to get a class c versus a class a right so another uh, con to the class c is they are a higher profile vehicle in terms of the chassis that they're on, right? So picture taking, you know, you, your super duty truck out there and putting this big giant thing on top of it, you're good, there's more sway, there's more wind issues, there's a, just a little bit more motion, if you will, uh, not as smooth of a ride. Uh, bumpier. Well, and, and with a lot of with, with a lot of the class A's, you tend to get uh, a drop frame or a raised frame, whatever it is that they use, which gives you much more storage. Whereas with the with the with the class C, you, you're sitting on top of the frame, yeah. So that that pops it up a little bit. I wouldn't say that it's a higher profile, but because of the chassis that's underneath that big box it's not beefy enough and so you do get a little more sway you do get a little bit more you know tense moments behind the wheel but i would own a class a class c again sure wouldn't you yeah yeah it's just consider it right it's, just think about it yeah it's it's just a, a con of it and and then um from a mileage standpoint if you get a gas engine it's like any any vehicle that's gas you know 10 years you know you're looking at, at 10 years on a diesel engine, 100,000 miles is nothing to blink at. Because here's here's what you really need to know, right? First of all, the newer gas engines in, in, in this era last longer than the ones from the 70s and 80s, right? They're built better, they're built, they're engineered better. The other thing is I, I'm a firm believer that if you take care of a motor, if you take care of an engine, regular maintenance and you don't, you know, you're not hard on it, um, it's going to last you a lot longer than it might another person, another average person, right? So what you really want to do with any engine is you want to marry the maintenance schedule. You want to own that maintenance schedule so that you keep up with it and you serve the engine, it will serve you. As well as your tires. He's a big tire guy. They know, <laughs> had they know that. You know that, right? <laughs> Okay. Don't so, forget, Don. This is a two-camera shoot. We have a camera right there. Say <laughs> hi. <laughs> okay. So now we're moving on to class A's, right? 
Um, again, uh, my first pro on here is a superior chassis, superior chassis, engine, and towing capabilities with yeah. the Class A. And then longevity, um, again, we talked about that. Easy setup and breakdown. I think that's probably the main reason people buy A's, right? Is it's just easy. It They're is. easy to drive. It's a beefier frame. It's a beefier powertrain. And yeah, they're just easy. You pull in, you push your button that's right beside your seat, you, it levels you out. Always put your, my opinion, always put your slides out first, then hit your level button, and you're pretty much done. You're at least what I call pre-done, yeah. right? You are, you are pre-set up. Um, because what I tend to do is I get all of that stuff done, and then I might take a break for a few minutes and get my TVs going on the inside and get into the air conditioning. Then I go out and hook up my water and my, my well, I'll, I'll tend to hook up my electric right away. But other than that, I don't hook up my sewer hoses and stuff right at first. I, I do that as time goes by. So, but they're just easier. I'm sorry, I went off no, on No, no, it's okay. Roll. And you and you pull in, you know, pulling in to a spot rather than backing in. Uh, pulling in is always easier driving. Well, you might have to back them occasionally into a spot. Not yeah. all spots are pull through. But it's not the same. But it's like, it's just, it, you're backing a big old truck, bus, whatever, versus trying to maneuver a trailer. And we all know, if you well, you haven't seen me do it because I won't let her film me, but uh, it's uh, it's a nightmare for me. I mean, I don't, it he doesn't- makes it look easy. It doesn't make me afraid. I, it used to when I was first starting out, but it, it, it is just, it's a mental, constant calculation in your head of where it's gonna go next and oh no, I now I need to do this. Whereas with this big boy, you just you just back it in. It's like backing in a very, very, very big minivan. You know, he said one time, it's really a confidence thing. I think a lot of people are afraid of getting a, even a pull trailer or whatever because they, they've never done it before and they don't know how to do it. If you tell yourself you can do this and you keep in mind you just keep trying. You just, you just keep practicing. You know, it's it's a learn. There's a learning curve to everything, but it's doable. Lots and lots of people no, do it. No, no, and you know what? I know a guy that can that can literally pretty much back any trailer into any spot, pretty much on the first stab. He's great at it. His his mind works. The geometry in his head clicks for him. That would not be us. That's not us at all. <laughs> but my attitude is, okay, so it took me eight stabs. I got it parked and I got it exactly how we wanted it so we can get our awning now. And each and time it gets yeah. easier. It does, it does. It's just, There's just a learning curve. don't ever let that stop you from getting a trailer of any kind. It is, yeah. you will, you'll get that figured out. You go to a parking lot and practice. We practiced with the fifth wheel at a parking lot for about five hours one day. I'm not much better now than I was when we practiced, yeah. but it's that's what you do. You get confident with it. Set up a couple of cones or a couple of obstacles for yourself if there's no lines in the parking lot. Go to a church, go to Ikea, go, you know, on the weekends when a big a big lot is empty, you know, and, and, and practice. And don't be afraid to do that. I say that, although I have not done that with this fifth wheel yet. <laughs> okay, so here's a good here's a goofy analogy and then we'll move on. Here's my analogy that in my head, which is probably where the confidence came from. I can get in my truck, hitch up my fifth wheel, and drive it anywhere in the land, right? It's highway, side streets, whatever, and not even, I'm, I'm relaxed almost when I'm driving. I'm very aware of what's going on around me because I got a lot of weight and I'm big, but I'm relaxed driving it, right? Backing it in is a little tense. I'm not afraid of it, but I am tense, I wanna do it right. I wanna get it right and I don't wanna hit anything, right? Picture an airline pilot. Monday through Friday, air, the, the weather is great, he flies, he flies, everything is wonderful, sun shining, he lands, every t landing is just textbook landing. But now it's Saturday, he's flying again. And it's a 40 mile an hour crosswind or whatever the plane will tolerate. It's a huge crosswind, and now he's got to land. And that's kind of and how it's I, raining, that's and kind it's of, lightning. That's <laughs> how I look at, at backing it in. I've driven in this fair weather. I got there fine, but now comes the now comes the hard part. But guess what? I got to do it. He's got to land that airplane. It's going to come down either with or without him. <laughs> I've got to back in, or we're going to be sleeping on a street somewhere 
because that's the only place I could park. So that's how I look at it is enjoy the drive. Don't worry about when you get there. You'll get there when you get there. And when you get there, that's when all of the geometry fires up and you got to back it in. That's what a pilot does. Easy flight, easy flight. The weather's bad in Cincinnati. It's going to be bad in Cincinnati. I know it's going to be bad, but I'm not worried about it. Now I got to land in Cincinnati where the weather is horrible. That's how I look at, at my at pull on my trailer. The drive is great. I'm going to enjoy the drive. And when I get there, the hard part happens. And guess what? I can take five or six tries at it until I get it right. But we will be camping in that spot tonight. There's a lot of groups out there that you can hook up with that will help you. There are other RV owners who are always, always quick to help. It's the most wonderful community of people I've ever met. Um, there are companies you can pay that will teach you how to do it if that's the route you want to go. Um, so there's the first, the first three or four times we parked the Springdale, it was the first time I'd ever towed a, a trailer. We'd had pop-ups and I could pretty much maneuver those by hand. The first two or three times, these guys in the campground come up and they're like, hey man, you want, you want me to give you some help? They can tell when you're struggling. Me, meaning verbal help, right? And I'm, I'm like, here's the key. <laughs> Just back it in for me. And every time that those guys helped me, they backed it in perfect. They were happy, I was happy, I complimented them, gave them a beer, life goes on. <laughs> You will never be stranded trying to figure out how to park That's in so a campground. That's so true. It's so true. Listen to your spotter, your, your regular spotter, whoever that is, wife, spouse, whatever, because I know our rig better than the guy who has the trailer next to us. I love it that he wants to help and that's great, but there are many times they don't know what's on your roof. They don't know how many ACs you've got. They haven't done this several times already with your rig, right? And oh, God forbid it was his fault that you ran into something. I would rather him run into a tree because it was my fault than a stranger. God, you know? That's true. And, and so sometimes when those people come over to help, because you don't want to be rude to them, right? They're just trying to be good Samaritans. Let them stand there and guide you or whatever. But what I do now is I just listen to her. Yeah. I, it doesn't, not to be rude, but it doesn't matter what this guy over here is telling me. I listen to her and I do what she tells me to do. He can say what he wants to say. Ultimately, if the camper ends up in the same place that he wanted it and she wanted it and I wanted it, it's a it's a win win win. It happens so, a lot, so yeah. really really. But if you help. want the help, let them help you. Yeah. Most of the time, they won't offer unless they know they can That's do it. That's true too. They won't offer unless they know they can back your rig for you or at least guide you into your spot. That's why I don't offer part mostly is because I'm not sure I'm any better at it than they are. Class A uh, on the pro side, the only other thing I had on there was that it's a smoother ride, right? Because of the. Suspension it's, and it's and let me let me add to that because she's right 100% it's a beefier frame beefier suspension most of most cla most class A's have something class C's don't have most of them have airbag suspension so you can literally adjust the suspension as you're going down the road and you can make it soft the other thing that is that's a kind of an add-on is for when you're in the cabin the front area where you drive a class A is much easier for your passenger to get up and walk to the back then climbing up out of a class C. So class A's just class A's just have a lot more comfort potential. Now, what we don't like, have you got to the cons? Yeah, I have it. Um, there was a, a, some... What I'd like to tell you in the cons, I'm gonna wait. <laughs> um, isn't there something with a class A where the wheelbase can be behind the, the uh, the front uh, driver's side, does it change how that ride is affected by where the where the wheels sit as well? Well, yeah, on, on a Class A, um, typically you are sitting over the axle. That's what it And is. that can, depending on the model, that can be either m more of a nicer ride or less of a nicer ride. Um, you can, in some of the models, you can get some pretty good road vibration sitting in that seat. In others, it's the ideal stable place uh, for those front seats to be. The other thing is they have tag axles, which, which pop in and assist you when you need to as well. Those tag axles will also steer at the rear, so they help you with your cornering. Yeah, that whole tag axle thing kind of freaks me out, but I just don't understand it yet. Okay, on the con side of a Class A, really pricey. Right. I mean, it's the most expensive of pretty much all of the all of the motorhomes out there. Um, 
I think without a doubt. I think without a doubt, they, most of them, I don't, I don't, uh, there's probably one or two. I, I don't think you can get into one for less than 200,000. Roughly, uh, you can get into a gas class A beginning price point somewhere around 130, 140. But when you get to diesel class A's, there's nothing under 200,000. Nothing. Yeah. Um, that's, that's pretty, pretty much true. Unless you go used, right? And, and used has a lot of, um, variables to consider too that we don't even have on our pro yeah, and con list that's another um, video <laughs> you know who drove it has, has it ever been in iraq is the frame bent there's other considerations when you start talking used but what what also the the big giant pro to used is the depreciation yeah. you don't eat all of that depreciation with a used it's already been uh, eaten by the person that bought it before you. And I, so I do want to talk about that in another video as well. I think it's really important to share some of those thoughts with you guys as well. Um, but for uh, the other thing, and we'll get into the diesel versus gas in just a minute, just that specific. But as far as a con goes on the Class A, also um, the maintenance. Uh, so while there is less frequent maintenance, your maintenance costs are much more expensive. Less frequent maintenance if it is a diesel. You're limited to who can work on a Class A. You're going to be taking it to those types of uh, repair shops that already know you're pulling in in a pricey dollar uh, vehicle, and you're going to you're just going to pay more per well, hour. Their hourly labor. labor rate is is yeah. high because it's diesel. I mean, it, it, yeah. I assume that's what we're talking or about class, here. Yeah, right. Well, either one. These are just generic. Class products. A gas. You probably it's probably not. We're going to get into horrible. the gas versus. I think what we I think what we can tell you, and you know it probably already, is diesel is ex more expensive everywhere. It's more expensive fuel usually. It's more expensive maintenance. It's more expensive when you have to buy parts for it, mm -hmm. but it will live forever. Yeah. So, um, and that's the, and it has the power and, and all of the other things that a gas doesn't have. That's the trade off is the fat is the life. It's like, you're going to spend a little bit more along the way, but you're not going to be replacing your engine at a hundred thousand miles. There are class A's out there that they drop a crate motor in at the hundred thousand mile mark and kind of start off with a new engine again. So, um, it just, it, it, I have always said this, it depends on, it's like dogs, right? Hot, another analogy. It's like angry dogs. People t label dogs, certain breeds of dogs as angry. And I, and I always say, it's really not about the dog. It's about the owner. Same thing with an engine. It's not about the engine, the type, the style. It's about the person that owns it and how they take care of it. That's a good analogy. I like that. So just a brief little uh, ending here. We just kind of wanted to share diesel versus gas. And uh, take it, Carl. Well, I, I, I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, that's, where, that's where a big part of your decision comes in because of the cost difference, right? A diesel is gonna automatically cost you, depending on what you're looking at, 10 to $20,000 more it's gonna drive the price of the vehicle up, depending, right? And that's broad statement. But but what you get with the diesel, and I've talked about this already, is you get much more pulling power, towing power, pushing power, whatever it is with a diesel. You take hills better, faster, smoother. Um, you don't put as much wear and tear on your transmission as you do with a gas engine because there's a different shift ratio, gear ratio on a diesel. Um, because it runs at such low RPMs. The reason they run for so long and last for so long is because they do the same or more work at a much lower RPM than a gas engine. You'll be cruising along in a gas engine at 3,500 RPM. You'll be cruising along in a diesel engine at about 2,000. So because of that, they, that drives their life expectancy out much further. You add a good routine maintenance schedule to that diesel engine and you, you can put two, 300,000 miles on it without blinking and, 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 or pain, right? With a gas engine though, you get a, a, usually a, a less expensive fuel for them. Uh, you don't have DEF fluid, by the way, that's another added expense for when you drive a diesel, you have to put that DEF fluid in there. And it stands for, DEF stands for? Diesel exhaust fluid. And it runs about $40. Um, no, no, no. 
What, you know, what's the cost of that? It's twelve dollars for for a, a two and a half gallon jug of it. And you put that in about every six times you fuel up. Six or seven, yeah. It depends. It depends on how hard you're driving the vehicle and how far at a time. But basically, um, it's it's required by law on all newer diesel engines and it, it's a part of the emission standard. So and you can get that stuff at a truck stop, by the way. It's right next to the diesel. Um, yeah, they have a fuel, fueling yeah. spout yeah, for it at truck stops. Makes it real convenient. When I'm not out and about and getting around or near truck stops, I, I order it on Amazon in two and a half gallon. We got a video on it. If you check back, uh, I don't know where one it was, but we, we've shown it it's before. A, it's about it. five episodes behind this one. Yeah. So. You do have some uh, some extra expense with the diesel, and, and that's what you have to weigh with your budget. I, I, again, I, I think I said earlier, um, for our purposes, we're kind of looking strongly at, at a gas if we go Class A. We, we, I feel more comfortable working around a gas engine, even though there's not that much I can do with a modern engine, but I can at least change my own oil. I can at least diagnose a problem easier with a gas engine than with a diesel engine. I'm just more comfortable with a uh, gas engine than a diesel engine. And I think for us, that just makes sense. I'm not sure how much longer we're gonna yeah. be on the road. I, th I don't I know see us in something 20 years. Right, right, we're gonna full time after we retire. But I don't know for how long, but I also know I'm going to take care of that motor. So if we need to get 200,000 miles out of it, we'll be able to, right? One of the things we didn't mention when we were talking about the cons of the Class C and the Class A, unlike the fifth wheels, the floor plans in a Class A and a Class C are almost always either the same, the same or, <laughs> or one little change or they're in reverse, but they're still basically the same feel inside on every class A you look at, every class C you look at. Just it's a different color and a different day. It almost comes down to, it, it, you're because you're not gonna get much of a choice on floor plan, so it comes down to the style. We'll have the bedroom slide and the kitchen slide, because once you get that figured out, you're not gonna get much of a variation from maker to maker. So then it becomes the brand, who made it and how much is it gonna cost. So um, that's the only part about a Class A and at first that really, when we started kind of looking at them a little bit, that really bugged us. And now it's kind of like, okay, so if the floor plan is gonna be the same as every other Joe Blow on the road, I'm fine with that, but I at least want the little accoutrements that I want. You want a washer and dryer not a combo. I, I want to make sure that I'm sitting across from my TV. I mean, your decision-making process for class A or C is go, becomes limited compared to a fifth wheel. Fifth wheel, you've got rear living, front living, mid bunk, mid, you got a lot of ch ch a lot of opportunity to make decisions with your style and floor plan of a fifth wheel as compared to A's and C's. A's and C's, the reason we're even looking at the A's and C's is for convenience and ease of parking, ease of hookup, ease of, you know, getting and going. We're getting older. She is. There's, there's more physicalness to this task. I make her do most of it. And so we are taking into consideration, God forbid, what if one of us became slightly more physically unable to do the things that we do now, right? What would that look like? How can we make this lifestyle work for us in those? They do make uh, handicap accessible RVs now, which I think is lovely. Um, but yeah, it's a consideration. Yeah. Okay, we're both we're both heading rapidly towards retirement, and so I will tell you this: I have enough problems. If I if I get down on my knees to do something, I have enough problems getting up now. I don't know what that's going to look I'm like. I'm like, what else can I do while I'm down here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. I don't know what that's going to look like though five years from now. It's already rough, right? And so the easier it gets to do some of these things around the rig, the more sense it makes for us to have that kind of rig. And again, you're, we know this and you will know it too. You probably already know it. You will never find the perfect rig. So you get the things that you that are, you make a list of the deal, deal breakers. breakers. For right us, call. two deal breakers have just come to mind and there's more. One is the TV has to be directly across from the, the main seating area, whether it's the love seats or, or it's two recliners or whatever. And two, deal breaker, the seats that we sit in as our regular sitting position when we're, when we're camping. 
have to be extremely comfortable. We have a couple of recliners right now that we barely can like. We yeah. barely well, like them. You know. The back part doesn't recline and they're manual, which is okay, but they're very narrow and there's no place to put anything when you're sitting in there. They're just not, just overall not comfortable. So those are two of the deal breakers. The third deal breaker is, and, and we're kind of vacillating on that. Oh, the king size bed. Yeah. We, we, we were considering that a king size bed was a deal breaker for us because we sleep with both of our dogs and I, you, you guys seen Bentley, but I am half the person I used to be. So <laughs> I am much smaller and we find that, you know, maybe it's not quite as important as it used to be. More, more important would be the spa, softness or firmness of it rather yeah. than the side. Yeah. So hey guys, uh, we want to thank you. I'm going to look at this camera. We want to <laughs> thank you for joining us today. We had a blast going through this with you and Donna, Donna is so cool about being able to put these kinds of pros and cons lists together. She actually did a list before she married me and we won't go into that. <laughs> yeah, that's not. <fine. laughs> so do us a big favor, hit the like, subscribe, share, and we'll see you next week.